welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. Today's session is part of our dermatology series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Department of Dermatology. Before I get started, I just want to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use a chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for in the end. Only Blum Center staff and our guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. Okay, so next I would like to introduce you all to our guest speaker. Joining us today, we have Dr. Jeff Yu. Dr. Yu is the director of the Mass General Contact and Occupational Dermatitis Clinic. He is currently on the board of directors for the American Contact Dermatitis Society and is an active member of the Society of Pediatric Dermatology and Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance. His research interests focus on allergic contact dermatitis in children, and he joins us today to give a talk on poison ivy dermatitis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yu. Thank you so much, Amy, for having me, and I'm so glad to be able to talk to you guys about poison ivy. You know, it's that perfect time of year where weather is getting warmer, we're able to go out, we are hopefully taking in some of that nature, but as we're cleaning out our yards and as we are hiking in those in our, in our favorite um, places, we see and we are seeing a lot of poison ivy, um, especially in our dermatology clinic. Now, most of poison ivy probably doesn't make it to a dermatologist per se, but a lot of poison ivy that the urgent care, the emergency department, the primary care doctor either misdiagnose or are unable to treat sufficiently do make it to us. So we tend to see some of the more, um, either the more subtle cases or the ones that are a bit more exuberant that require treatment. So today I kind of want to talk to you guys about this type of poison family. So we're not just talking about poison ivy, we're going to talk about poison oak and we're going to talk about poison sumac in there as well. We're going to go through a little bit of the way they look, to identify them, and most importantly, how can we prevent and treat it when this does occur? So um, this is just a picture of poison ivy that I pulled from New York Times, and you can see it just kind of looks like weeds. So for some of us who are maybe not as keenly aware of where we can find these type of poisonous plants, I can tell you just even walking outside my neighborhood and I live in a pretty urban setting right along the path, you see plenty of leaves that look just like this um, that are kind of sprouting up around this time of year. So definitely do not go ahead and touch them and see if you can check them out and find out if it's poison ivy. Trust me, you don't want to know. So before we kind of get started here, um, I just have a few disclosures here. I don't have any that's relevant to this talk. Again, I'm not a botanist, so I'm not a um, I'm not an expert on plant identification. I do have several photos of different types of poisonous plants that might be helpful for you guys to kind of just take a look at. It may be some key um, points at how can you tell that maybe this is poison ivy or maybe this is not. I do use a lot of photos in here. Most of them are from published reports um, that have already received patient content, um, consent. And some of them are also from internet sources as cited here. And then none of these are from patients of mine and none of them are from patients that have not consented to having their photographs taken. So a few things here I wanna make sure we can take away from this talk. We're gonna talk about the epidemiology and geographic distribution. So we're gonna talk about how many people get it. We're gonna talk about where can you find these plants and why do we care about it? We're gonna understand a little bit about why these plants are quote unquote poisonous and why do they cause allergic reactions in people because you touch plenty of other plants, right? Tulips are blooming, daffodils, things like that. Why don't they cause an allergic reaction as well when you come in contact with them? And then finally, and most importantly, I think we're gonna learn about how do we prevent and treat if you were to come in contact with these plants or if you are suspicious about coming in contact with these plants. So this is a fairly typical type of patient that we end up seeing in the dermatology clinic where you have a person that comes in with a really itchy rash that's kind of blistering. 
it mostly on the forearms, on the wrists, on the hands, as well as on their body and their legs. So pretty widespread and overall just very uncomfortable. Good story about clearing the weeds and brush from his backyard two days ago. So that's when we kind of start thinking maybe this is something that they came in contact with. And then he has tried some of the most common over-the-counter things, Benadryl, calamine lotion, all these things don't tend to do very much, especially for the type of condition that we are dealing with. He went to the local urgent care, got seven days of an oral steroid and oral antibiotics because they weren't sure if this is an infection. He saw a little bit of improvement, but then once the steroid kind of ran out after seven days, he got a little bit worse and he feels like the rash is spreading. These, again, these are the people that tend to make it into our clinic um, and to be seen by a dermatologist because the main question is, is it or is it not a poison ivy or a poison plant related rash? So the first part of this talk is we're going to focus a little bit on, how, on who gets it and the geographic distribution of where you can find these plants. So throughout the United States, in a lot of parts of the world, not everywhere, but in a lot of parts of the world, poison ivy, poison sumac, and poison oak are the most common allergens that people come in contact with. Somewhere around 10 to 50 million Americans are affected every single year by poison ivy. Some people get a very minor little bit of a rash. Some people get this full-blown, full-body eruption that's extremely uncomfortable, and that's usually what lands them in the doctor's office. There are at least 43,000 visits to the emergency department every single year, but most of these cases are seen in the urgent care setting or in the primary care setting. Up to 75, and I've seen some estimates of up to 90% of Americans are sensitized to poison ivy. What that means is there's not a, most likely if you were to come in contact with poison ivy, you will get a rash. Not everyone, but most likely you will. 80 to 90% of people are probably allergic to the poison ivy. If you think about that, there's probably nothing else in the world here that 80 to 90% of the people are truly allergic to. Sure, you might be thinking about other types of allergies like peanuts and eggs and things like that, but that's kind of the minority of folks who are allergic to those things versus poison ivy. The vast majority of people are allergic to it. That's why we see so much of poison ivy. Most commonly, we're going to find um, people making it um, into the hospital in the spring and the summer and the fall. As the winters get a little bit warmer, there are certainly some cases that may occur in the winter as well, but the vast majority, probably the spring, summer, and fall. Now, poison ivy can look different depending on the season, and that's what makes it a little bit tricky. The most common type um, or the most common photos that you are going to see when it comes to poison ivy is you're going to see pictures of them being green leaves, right? That common saying of leave, um, leaves of three, let them be, is absolutely correct. They usually grow in triplets. So you're going to see three different leaves on one stalk. Sometimes it could be smooth edged. Sometimes it can be toothed. So that's a little bit tougher to tell. Oftentimes they will have little flowers and little berries on there as well. And then for me, at least, thinking about the fact that they kind of have a reddish stem can be pretty helpful because a lot of these other shrubs out there that have a green stem, with green leaves, much less likely to be something like poison ivy. But the color can change. In the spring, maybe you'll get a little bit more of kind of like a pinkish kind of appearance to it. Summer tends to be that more typical appearance. Fall, you can certainly get some of that fall foliage appearance with the orange as well as the yellow. And then in the winter, they can look deeply red too. But I think one of the features just to kind of pay attention to is the color of their stem, um, especially when they tend to be most active is that it's reddish. And then also they come in leaves of three. So where can you find poison ivy? Well, the short answer is pretty much everywhere, all right? So there's two different types of poison ivy that predominate in the United States. There's something called the Eastern poison ivy, which historically is mostly the Eastern part of the US, Western poison ivy historically in the West Coast. However, nowadays there's a lot more blending of where the um, poison ivy is. What about poison oak? Here's another plant that's closely related to the poison ivy family, it causes a very similar type of eruption. Um, and the main difference between poison oak and poison ivy are the, um, are the shape of their leaves. So unlike the smooth or the tooth edge leaves that you're gonna get in poison ivy, poison oak has much more these kind of oak appearing leaves. So a little bit broader, a little bit smoother on the edges, less of that kind of tooth or sharp shapes, um, sharp edge shaped leaves. And these are also comes in threes and you can see the stem is also a little bit more on the reddish side. 
Where can you find poison oak? Well, much less common up here in Massachusetts or in the New England area, as you can tell on this map, much more likely to be kind of in slightly swampier, warmer areas in the Southeast, for example, and then certainly on the West Coast, all the way even up through British Columbia in Canada. And then finally, there is um, poison sumac, which is something else that we often hear about. Unlike poison ivy and poison oak, the leaves do not appear in threes, but they tend to come as a stem with five to 13 different leaves. So lots and lots of leaves, as opposed to just three of them. They tend to be smooth edged. They have little kind of odd shaped berries, especially in the summertime. Um, and you can see, again, the stem is kind of reddish here that might clue you into the fact that this is not a very pleasant plant to be coming in contact with. Where can you find poison sumac? It's certainly um, very widespread, especially on the eastern half of the United States, even going down into Texas and as far north as Canada as well. But in our region, at least, poison ivy and poison sumac are two of the most common types of um, plants that can induce skin allergy, poison oak, much less common to find, at least in our area here. So pretty much no matter where you live in the United States, there's a poisonous plant. Um, you're going to come in contact with something at some point on your hike or when you're clearing out the backyard that might give you an itchy rash. The two places, Alaska and Hawaii, tend to have much less of these, if any, at all. And what about climate change? Well, thinking about the fact that maybe some of our New England winters are getting a little bit warmer, perhaps that there's a bit more CO2 in the air, is this making a difference on poison ivy? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, poison ivy is a type of plant that thrives on carbon dioxide. And as the amount of carbon dioxide potentially increases in our atmosphere, they are going to make poison ivy itchier. To show that, scientists at Duke in North Carolina pumped extra amounts of CO2 levels into a certain area of the forest in one of the pine forests down there near where they are. And they did this over the course of six years. And they found that poison ivy growth compared to other areas where they did not um, pump this extra amount of carbon dioxide into, they found that poison ivy grew an average of 150% faster than um, poison ivy that was not in these increased CO2 levels. The size of leaves were much larger and they made a lot more of what makes them allergic, which is this chemical called urushiol that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. So overall, you're gonna have more poison ivy, bigger poison ivy leaves, and more allergenic poison ivy as well, especially with our slightly warmer winters than we used to have. There is also more spreading of poison ivy plants into colder climates where they may not have survived some winters in the past or maybe not some regions of the United States. So certainly I think the poison ivy problem is going to become more widespread as time goes on, making prevention as well as treatment even more important than they are now. So the name is a little bit of a misnomer because it's neither poisonous or ivy. You're not gonna die when you come in contact with poison ivy. Um, it's gonna cause you a pretty itchy rash, but certainly there are no other significant health detriments to poison ivy contact. They are in the genus of Toxicodendron, and that really means poison tree. So that kind of gives you an idea of the type of plant that um, botanists really um, suggest that this, is, that this is. In that same family are poison ivy, poison oak, as well as sumac. But it also includes some plants that we eat all the time, pistachios, mangoes, cashews. And um, that's because the shells of these plants, so cashew oil, or sorry, cashew shell, pistachio oil, mango peel, they can potentially contain the same type of chemical that causes allergic contact dermatitis to poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. And certainly we do see some patients who said, I had a reaction after biting into a mango peel or coming in contact with cashew oil or something along those lines. All these plants make a sap called the urushiol, and that is the allergenic component. If you don't come in contact with the sap and you come in contact with the plant alone, that is not a big deal at all. The, the word urushio actually comes from a Japanese word, which is urushi, and that is, a, um, that is a type of a sap that you derive from Japanese lacquer trees, and it's used to make different types of instruments and decorative bowls and things like that. And the first account of a poison ivy rash was from the Chinese literature back in the seventh century. So poison ivy and knowledge of poison ivy has been around for a very, very long time, and is certainly an international issue, not just in United States problem. This was actually a report of a patient that, um, that was playing an ancient, um, ancient, Asian, ancient Chinese instrument. And this ancient Chinese instrument shown down here 
is actually covered with this Yurushi lacquer that the um, Japanese make. And this type of Yurushi lacquer contains some of the Yurushiol in the poison ivy. And this is a gentleman that was allergic to poison ivy and he had borrowed this instrument from his professor. So he's never, he doesn't own this instrument. He's never played it before, but he was interested in trying it out. So his professor loaned it to him. And within a few weeks of playing, you can see what happened to his hands. His left hand developed these kind of big blisters, especially over the fingertips, but his right hand was completely normal. The reason for that was because the right hand is the side that he uses to pluck the string. So there's no contact with the actual base or the body of the instrument that has that Yurushi versus the left hand pushes down on the string, similar to how you play a guitar, um, where you're pushing down on the strings and directly coming in contact with the baseboard. And that part does have Yurushi in it. So he's actually getting poison ivy contact dermatitis on his hand from playing this instrument alone because of contact from the Yurushio. So you can see how potentially allergenic this chemical is, especially to those people who are sensitized to it. So that's kind of a good segue into, well, how does poison ivy dermatitis occur? Um, why, why are people allergic to say poison ivy, but not allergic to tulips or daffodils or orchids or any of these other plants that are kind of, you know, that also have green leaves and that potentially also has a sap and things like that. So like I mentioned before, Yurushio is kind of that allergenic chemical that is made in the plants themselves. So when that plant is disturbed, whether you, you rip the leaves or you come in contact with the stem or you break the stem and the sap gets out, that is what causes the rash. If you just gently touch the leaves and there is no sap that gets deposited on your skin, you are not going to get this rash. So Yurushio itself is that allergenic component and it's shown here, contact with it leads to a rash. Now, to kind of get into the details a little bit more, what actually happens when you get in contact with something like Ruscio in your body that is actually causing this rash to occur? Well, there are actually two phases to this, and this is true for all of allergic contact dermatitis. So whether you are allergic to, your, to the poison ivy plant, or if you're allergic to a cheap earring, for example, that you're wearing that contains nickel and you're allergic to it, the process is pretty similar. I'm not going to get into the weeds with all the different types of molecules and the signaling and stuff, but just kind of a 30,000 foot view here. Starting on the left side, what happens when you come in contact with the urushio from the leaves? It goes through your skin and you have these type of um, cells in the top layer of your skin called Langerhan cells. Their job is to grab the allergen or grab whatever is coming through and introduce it to your immune system. The way it does that is it grabs these little red dots. So imagine if those red dots were the urushio, and it goes through your lymph system, like your, which is a pathway that the white blood cells takes to get out, get out into the skin to start detecting things, fight bacteria, all that kind of stuff, or create allergic reactions. The longer Han cells are and take these roads and take these highways, and it's going to take them to a nearest lymph node. And within these lymph nodes are a lot of these immature white blood cells kind of just waiting there, maturing, um, learning things about the body, learning things about the environment. And what the longer Han cell is doing is that it's going to the lymph node and says, hey, look, I have this allergen here. Learn about it. So it's teaching all these T cells or all these white blood cells about this allergen. The first time you come in contact with poison ivy in your entire life, you're not going to get a rash. The reason for that is because your body hasn't learned about it yet. If your body hasn't seen it, you're not allergic to it until your body decides to see it and decides to become allergic to it. When does it choose to see it? When does it become allergic to it? That nobody understands yet. But all we know is that the first step is your body sees it, your body teaches some white blood cells about it, and your white blood cell says, oh yeah, we're going to become allergic to this. So the next time you come in contact with it, which is the right-hand side, the same thing happens. The Yurushio makes it through the um, top layer of your skin, gets picked up by these longer Han cells, which then travel to the lymph node and says, hey, look what I found. You guys know about this. Let's do something. So then the white blood cells then are ready and primed and good to go. They exit these lymph nodes, travel along the lymph vessels and make it back into your skin, at which point they will create inflammation, which is defined by redness and swelling, sometimes blisters, 
most of the time itching and discomfort in those areas where you came in contact with this oil. So again, it's not the first time you come in contact with poison ivy that you get the rash, it's the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time. And each time you come in contact with poison ivy or another type of an allergen, you will get that reaction faster and faster because your body is ready for it. It's ready to pounce. It's ready to send those white blood cells out into the skin to create this type of inflammatory reaction we typically call an itchy rash. Obviously, there's a lot more that kind of goes underneath, um, goes on under there, but I didn't want to get into the weeds here, but that's just very basically what happens when you come in contact with something that you're allergic to. This type of allergy is a specific type of allergy called a type for hypersensitivity reaction. This is very different than your springtime allergy to the pollen or your peanut allergy when you have a peanut butter sandwich. This is a very different type of allergy because in those instances, they actually depend on a very different type of cell called the mast cell and a very different type of chemical called histamine. In poison ivy related dermatitis, like type four hypersensitivity reactions, it requires that initial exposure where your body becomes sensitized. And in the subsequent exposure, you get a rash. And the type of cell it depends on is not a mast cell, but something called your T cells or your T lymphocytes. With each exposure, you get a rash. And then sometimes the first or the first time you get this rash, it could take 24, 48 hours because your body is kind of slowly waking up, has learned about it, but it has to make a few more cells before it really comes out into the skin to create this reaction. Each time this happens, your body is slightly more at the ready to attack. This is not caused by histamines. So what does that mean? Antihistamines are not gonna do anything. That's why with that initial person who came into the clinic with that really itchy rash, he tried some Benadryl, it didn't do anything. That's because this has absolutely nothing to do with histamine molecules. How do we treat this? Usually topical steroids can be very helpful if it's very localized or oral prednisone, which is a type of oral steroid. And that is that tends to be the treatment for the vast majority of cases, at least the ones that make it into dermatology clinic because they are severe enough to warrant some sort of a systemic treatment. What does poison ivy dermatitis look like and how do you know if you have it? Um, well, it's itchy. So if your rash is not itchy, it's probably not poison ivy. If it is itchy, it's oftentimes blistery, so you see a lot of water bubbles. It oozes, so if you were to poke at some of these water bubbles, you're gonna get this kind of sticky, yellowy fluid that comes out of it. And usually it starts on exposed areas. Why exposed? Well, those are the places that came in contact with poison ivy. Chances are poison ivy is not gonna start in your groin area, which is probably protected from poison ivy leaves. Um, but most likely to start somewhere like your ankles or your hands or your wrist, places that might have inadvertently brushed up or stepped on or came in contact with poison ivy of some sort. Usually we are looking for linear lines, meaning you brushed up against it, so it made a straight line on your skin. We always tell people nature does not make straight lines, meaning if it's a rash that's coming from the inside out, it's probably not gonna show up as a straight line, but a rash that's due to something you came in contact with from the outside, can make a straight line because you probably brushed up against it or walked right by it or something. So you see these lines and I'm gonna show you guys pictures later. Urushiol is a type of oil. So that type of oil can be transferred to other sites. So you touch the plant and you're like, well, I don't know if this is poison ivy, but I'm gonna roll my dice. So you touch that plant, then you touch your face because you have an itch. Then you scratch your arm because you have an itch or then you, you, know, you touch your scalp, whatever it may be. If that chemical gets transferred to those other areas, there is a very good chance you are about to develop a rash in those other locations too. Because of how inflammatory this reaction is, you can oftentimes get swelling. So if you get it on your face, unfortunately, you are probably going to have some facial swelling that can be a little bit uncomfortable. But because this is a type of contact dermatitis and not a systemic reaction, you should not have difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, stomach ache, diarrhea, things like that, that is much more typical for something like an anaphylaxis reaction, where if you were allergic to peanuts and you had a peanut butter sandwich, you, are, you might develop some of these other more systemic and arguably more dangerous um, and more of emergent symptoms compared to say poison ivy. Here are some photos of what poison ivy dermatitis look like. You can see here, blistery, a little bit oozy, mostly on the extensor surfaces. So we're talking about, sorry, mostly on the, um, on the extremities. So on the arms, 
here on the forearms. And then here you see that very typical linear streaks in these little water bubbles or kind of blistery appearing rash, very, very typical for poison ivy. This is an example of a young woman who got this rash, somehow came in contact with her face, whether this is due to accidental face touching that area or maybe a transfer of that oil to other locations. You can see this red, swollen, itchy, maybe some blistering going on here as well. Pretty significant swelling of the eyes to the point where it's almost shut. Some blistering, some oozing. You can see this kind of shiny liquid showing up. These are all very typical photos of exuberant or severe poison ivy reactions. There is also another kind of a really cool um, clinical finding that can sometimes occur. And that is this black dot that you can sometimes see within the rash. Sometimes people are like, well, I've never had a mole there. I don't know how I just got a mole. That's not a mole. That's actually a special type of poison ivy reaction called black dot poison ivy. And the reason why it appears black is because the oil, the urushiol that you came in contact with, when it hits oxygen, so you rip the stem, you rip the leaf, and the oil comes out and it hits oxygen, it undergoes a chemical process called oxidation. And when urushio gets oxidized, it actually leaves black deposits on the skin. Sometimes it can be as big as this, or they can be tiny little black flecks. But usually when a dermatologist is looking at your skin, they're also looking for these little black flecks to tell you this was probably poison ivy as opposed to, say, another type of um, allergen that you came in contact with. So that is a hint that this is probably poison ivy if you see these little black dots within your rash. So the last part of my talk is focused on prevention and how do we treat it. If you were to look online, you're going to find some good resource here, um, resources here, and I'm hoping to kind of summarize all that information for you in the next few slides. So, you know, you got curious and you went out and you wanted to go pick for leaves, you want to go pick for mushrooms or something, but you, you know, unbeknownst to you, you wandered into a field of poison ivy. What do you do? Well, the number one thing is if you know you're going to be out there and you are venturing into an area where there is a lot of potential for contact with poison ivy, there are nice barrier protection medications that are available out there. The purpose of the barrier protection is to prevent absorption of the urushiol allergenic chemical when it comes in contact with your skin. Beyond just wearing long sleeve shirt, gloves, pants, maybe tucking your pants into socks and then wearing, you know, full cover boots, things like that, kind of that definitely protects your skin. If it's not possible to do that, maybe having on a barrier cream can be helpful. Now, this barrier cream has to be applied before the intended contact. One chemical that has been shown to be very helpful protection is something called quaternium 18 betonite, and the brand name here is Ivy Block. The idea is that you have to reapply every four hours or else your sweat and friction and whatever kind of just rubs it off. Um, there's another chemical that you, there was another cream that you can try called Hollister Moisture Barrier, something else that you can consider. And then these creams are often standard for firefighters that might be working in, you know, forest fires, especially out west, for example, or forestry workers that very frequently come in contact with potential poisonous plants, including poison ivy, poison sumac, poison oak, things like that. You can easily find ivy block online, REI, places like that too. If you know you came in contact with it, there's a chance the oil could be on your clothing. Certainly don't touch your clothing and touch your face. That's one way of getting it, even though your body was covered. Discard all your clothing, You know, put it in a bag, wash it with soap and water and hot water in the um, washer right afterwards. That can oftentimes be helpful to get rid of that oil. Now, what if you came in contact with it on your skin and you didn't have barrier cream on, or maybe it was too late? Well, there are a few things that you could do. Number one is you can wash it off. By washing it off, you have to scrub in one direction. It's not helpful to scrub downwards and upwards and downwards and upwards because then you're really just kind of spreading that oil around. And there are some studies that show Yerusha oil can be washed off immediately. 50% of it is gone, or 50% of it can be washed off 10 minutes after exposure. 25% of it can be washed off 15 minutes ex um, after exposure. 10% washed off 30 minutes after exposure. But after 30 minutes, you're probably too late because that's the amount of time 
for the oil to number one, oxidize, and number two, be introduced to your longer Han cells that are kind of swimming and waiting underneath the skin to kind of grab at these allergens when they come there. So you're going to be protecting yourself 50% of the time if you wash it off in 10 minutes, because by then the longer Han cells have already grabbed some of the hapten or some of that allergen and introduced it to your T cells. If you come in contact with it right now and within a minute you wash most of it off, you're probably going to be okay. But most of us don't know when we have come in contact with it. The next thing you can do is instead of just water, you can use some soap. There are some soaps out there that have been shown to be very helpful at removing the Yusha oil. So remember, this is an oil. So if you have an oil, like if you were cooking, I don't know, if you were making bacon or something and your pot is oily, if you just use water and a sponge, you're probably not going to get that oil off of that pot very easily. But if you use some sort of a soap chemical that can really break up that oil, really allows you to wash it off much better. So one of the easiest things to find, in my opinion, is this Dawn Ultra dishwashing soap. It breaks down the oil, it gets rid of that oil, and you can certainly use it to wash off some of that urushia if it came in contact with your skin. There are some other proprietary products out there. One of them is called Technew that can also help remove poison oak and IV oils. And then Goop is another chemical that can help remove the oil when it comes in direct contact with your skin. Evidence really shows that if you do this within two hours, you have a pretty good chance of getting rid of that oil. That being said, you're, you may not be preventing the reaction, but you may be preventing the extent of that reaction if you, were, if you were to not have washed it off in the first place. So certainly scrubbing in one direction, getting it off as quickly as possible, but within 10 minutes, ideally, certainly within 30 minutes, and then using one of these soaps or having them readily available to you after a hike can be very helpful. So what about treatment? So, you know, you were too late to wash it off. You didn't wear a barrier cream. Your body wasn't covered and you didn't have any of the soaps available and 30 minutes has gone by and you're thinking, shucks, now I'm probably gonna get this really itchy rash and I'm doomed for the next several weeks. Well, not necessarily so. Um, most non-dermatologists fail to treat poison ivy, sumac and oak sufficiently. They kind of give you a little bit of the treatment but not enough of the treatment. So a lot of people actually end up coming into the dermatologist's office when it quote unquote fails and they think maybe it's something different. The type of treatment we give depends on the severity and we usually rely on things like topical or oral steroids because they are absolutely necessary to curing some sort of poison ivy. Antihistamines do not work because for the reason that histamines are not the molecules that are activated when your body comes in contact with poison ivy. The only way antihistamines are actually helpful to you is if you tell me I have a lot of trouble sleeping at night because of how itchy I am, then sometimes the sedating antihistamines like Benadryl can be very helpful because it makes you sleepy, not because it actually helps you with your rash. So when limited to say the wrist, just the hand, just the ankle area, and it really hasn't spread anywhere else, well, you probably don't need an oral or a systemic uh, medication to treat that. Perhaps you can get away with just using a topical steroid uh, that's medium or high potency, over-the-counter hydrocortisone, way too weak, not going to do anything for you at all. Um, but a medium to high strength topical steroid, use it over the itchy rash twice a day for up to two weeks is completely okay. That could be very helpful to kind of take care of that localized itchy poison ivy rash. Again, Benadryl, hydroxyzine, these sedating ones can be helpful with sleep. I don't tend to see a lot of that mild poison ivy. My guess is it's because they are all treated at the urgent care, primary care level. Now, moderate to severe poison ivy, this is what we tend to see. Patients who come in that are very itchy, very uncomfortable, can't sleep at night, large areas of involvement. So it's not just the wrist, the ankle, it is most of the leg, most of the arm, chest, back, groin area, face, lots of swelling, lots of discomfort. And in these patients, use of topical steroid is not gonna be very beneficial at all. Um, it's like fighting a forest hot fire with your garden hose. You're probably not gonna be able to keep it under control um, with just the topical alone. These are the times when you need an oral or a systemic immunosuppressive medication for a short period of time, such as an oral steroid like prednisone. 
they are, not every patient is appropriate for prednisone. I can tell you the vast majority of patients do tolerate prednisone very, very well. But if you are one of those patients who can't tolerate prednisone, that's where you really need to have that conversation with your, um, with your physician about what other medications would be safe for you to do. Usually a three week taper is what is recommended. What a taper means is that you start at a higher dose and then you kind of go down for the second week, then you go down for the third week. So we slowly bring you down but we definitely hit you the hardest during that first week to really calm down this entire reaction. A lot of times though, in the urgent care or the primary care setting, people are given one week steroid tapers. Now, one week doesn't do enough because all the evidence shows that when you have poison ivy rash, your body is reactive for the next three weeks. So what's gonna happen for that first week? Well, the first day, Afterwards, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, this works. I'm much less itchy. I'm feeling good. Second day, you're even less itchy. Third day, you're even less itchy. But as you get closer to the end of that week, when the dose of steroids really start to fall, or by the end of the steroid doses altogether, your body is still reacting. You're still developing that allergic reaction. Now you just don't have any more medication on board. So if you don't have any medication on board, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to have what's called a rebound phenomenon where the rash is going to come back. So it's going to come back in those areas where you have the rash. You're going to get itchy again. You're going to become uncomfortable again. You are going to lose sleep again because the rash was not sufficiently treated with a long enough course of oral medication. Um, most patients then, therefore, in the derm clinic, at least, will be getting at least two, most likely three weeks of an oral medication to really keep this at bay until that three-week period goes by, your body stops reacting, the medication stops, and you are back on your way, okay? Um, sometimes there are um, places that instead of giving you an oral medication, uh, they will give you a steroid shot. The nice thing about getting that steroid shot, also known as an intramuscular shot of steroids is where they, um, sh um, where they put the medication directly into a muscle and over the course of the next three to four weeks, that steroid slowly releases itself from that muscle. It's as if you were taking a pill every day, except you are only doing it as a one-time shot. Some offices will do that as well because it really makes it more convenient for you, the patient, to not have to remember, oh yeah, today I need to take three pills of this and then two pills tomorrow and one pill the day after. It makes it much easier and much less um, or much more convenient for you to kind of fight this reaction off. So um, some take home points for you guys here um, listening to this talk, the poison ivy, poison oak and poison sumac are by far the most common causes of allergic contact dermatitis in the United States. Um, you know you have poison ivy when you see the streaky, itchy, blistery rash that shows up on the exposed surfaces. And if you see those little black dots, remember that is a great sign for black dot poison ivy. Prevention with a quick washing within 10 minutes, but certainly within 30 minutes, ideally with some sort of a soap, such as Dawn Ultra Dishwashing Soap for something that is easy to find at your local um, grocery store, and, and use of topical barrier creams and making sure you cover up with long sleeve shirt, pants, boots, socks, things like that can be very helpful to prevent you from getting poison ivy. And treatment usually involves up to three weeks of oral steroids because anything shorter can lead to a rebound phenomenon in that poison ivy reaction that makes you very uncomfortable. So with that, um, I thank you guys all for attending this talk on poison ivy. And hopefully you guys learned something here. And if you guys have any questions, I am available to answer them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu. We are now at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. So we have a question regarding a neighbor's tree with poison ivy located right next to their yard. Every May okay. while gardening, they contact poison ivy. It always seems to present itself on their right flank, which is always covered while gardening, but not on the hands. Why does it always seem to present itself on the flank? That's a little bit odd um, because unless you are directly coming in contact with that poison ivy on your right flank somehow, you shouldn't be getting it there and only there. That being said, there is a chance that you might be coming in contact with it on your hands if you wear a glove or something and, and perhaps you got an itch on your right flank, you went to scratch it, your gloves might be thick enough where the poison ivy oil doesn't make it through, but your shirt might be thin enough or if you get the oil on there, the oil does penetrate that shirt, but there must be some sort of a contact of the right flank to the poison ivy oil for that to actually occur. You cannot get poison ivy by looking at it. You can't get poison ivy by you know staring at it across the field. You have to come in contact with it one way or another. 
Thank you. Do we, should we worry about long-term corticosteroids in people with diabetes? Yes. So that is one of the populations where high dose steroids may not be ideal for you. Most of the time I do have patients who are diabetic. I just tell them, watch out for your blood sugar because the steroids can increase your blood sugar, but we're not giving you such a high dose that is, that tends to cause problems for diabetics. Now, usually I say, we will do a short course of steroids, monitor your blood sugar, see what happens. If you have a history of blood sugar control um, problems, especially while on steroids, I would say talk to your endocrinologist or your primary care doctor, and maybe they might be able to guide you. For people that can't be on prednisone because you either are allergic to prednisone or you have um, diabetes where your blood sugar is very difficult to control, there are other types of oral immunosuppressive medications, some of which include things like cyclosporin, for example, that work quickly, that are also safe to do for a short period of time, that are also immunosuppressive. The reason we don't give cyclosporin more often is because it's a little bit more expensive and it requires laboratory monitoring before you start and while you're on the medication, which we don't do necessarily for something like prednisone. Thank you. What is the recommended dose of intramuscular steroid for poison ivy dermatitis? So that's a great question. It largely depends on how much you weigh. Um, all these doses of steroids are depending on how much you weigh. If you are a 100 kilogram or 200 pound person, that dose is gonna be very different than if you were a 50 kilogram, 110 pound person. So it really depends on how much you weigh. And I would definitely talk to your doctor about that because it's not one size fit all. Thank you. When the poison ivy is weeping, is this spreading the rash to other areas? Great question. So no, when it's weeping, that is your body generating these blisters. It is your, it is your skin's fluid that is leaking out, not the actual oil itself is leaking out. So that leaking fluid is not contagious for poison ivy. You are contagious for poison ivy. So if you were to say, I went hiking today and I might've touched poison ivy, I don't have a rash yet because remember the rash takes 24, sometimes 48 hours to show up and you have that oil on your skin, and then you come in contact with somebody else. You hug your child, you touch your spouse, you do whatever before washing your hands or before taking a shower and all that. At that point, yes, you are potentially contagious, but often that is before the rash appears. We have a question regarding a product called Depomedrol. Can we use that for poison ivy dermatitis? Um, to my knowledge, Depomedrol is another name for an intramuscular um, steroids. So yes. Can you comment on um, a comment in the chat about how it seems to erupt at different times? Anything to you can comment on that? I don't know if it's regarding uh different seasons, times of the years, or I don't know if this person wants to clarify on that. So while we wait, to, we can always wait to see if the person can clarify on that and okay. I'll skip okay. to the next question. Okay. Um, does your reaction to poison ivy get worse with each exposure? Is yes. calamine lotion useful? And I've been told to put salt on the skin rash to dry it up. Is this useful? I would say um, poison ivy can definitely get worse with each subsequent exposure um, because remember each, each time it gets exposed, your body's T cells are, are replicating themselves. There's more and more and more. So each time you get that reaction, there's a good potential that there are just more cells there waiting to cause that inflammation. So you're just gonna have a whole bunch of them that come to the skin and create this brisk reaction. So not only can it be faster, it can potentially be more severe as well compared to that first time. Um, calamine lotion is helpful only in that it is an anti-itch medication. It doesn't actually do anything to abort the process of allergic contact dermatitis like a topical steroid or an oral steroid is going to do. So I think it's very symptomatic um, treatment. If you find it helpful, use it. If you don't find it helpful, I wouldn't use it. Um, in terms of salt, be very careful with this because your salt, the salt that you put on the skin is what's considered a desiccant. So it is more likely to dry out the skin. By putting it on the skin, you might cause more irritation. You might cause skin barrier damage and you actually might itch more because of it than, um, than if you didn't put it on there. And drying out the poison ivy doesn't make it any less itchy. It just makes it appear 
less oozy, but that's pretty much it. Thank you. So I received clarification that when this person has a rash, it seems to break out over different periods. Yep. And they start on the arms and then four days later on the legs or stomach. Can you comment more on that? Yeah, that's not un that is not unusual to see. So what happens is your arm came in contact with that oil first. Um, two possibilities for why you get it later on. Number one, maybe you spread it, but you didn't you didn't touch it at the at that instance when you went hiking. Maybe you got it more later on when you went home, when you got in the car, or whatnot. So maybe the time course is a little bit different, explaining why you're going to get it a little bit later in those less exposed areas. That's one possibility. The second, more likely possibility is that with poison ivy, your body is generating a very large inflammatory reaction. When you get a very large inflammatory reaction, your body starts getting a little bit confused as to where to direct that inflammation. So instead of saying, I'm just gonna direct this to the arm where this person has all the poison ivy, they're gonna start firing on all cylinders and start directing the inflammation everywhere else. And that is called auto eczematization or an ID, spelled I-D, an ID reaction, where you have a primary site of dermatitis. So your arm, your leg, wherever that poison ivy is the most angry, and you're going to have the secondary sites of rash, which could be on your belly, for example, that can show up sometimes days later after your body's already firing out all these cylinders. And that's a great example of why treating just that site alone with a topical steroid, for example, is probably not enough because you might need something a little bit stronger systemically to cover all of that. Thank you. Does Xanfil help with treating poison ivy dermatitis? Um, I think Xanfel is a wash that you can use. So again, with any of these washes that you use, you have to use it at least within two hours, ideally within 10 minutes if you can. And I think that's going to be the most helpful for you. It's not going to treat the poison ivy once you already have the poison ivy, but I think it's a potential, potentially beneficial thing to use when you come in contact with poison ivy, or even if you think you have. Thank you. Earlier on, you had recommended for clothes that had came, come in contact with poison ivy to wash them. Is one cycle sufficient or should we wash them more than once? Um, I think one cycle is probably sufficient because you are using laundry detergent and the detergent, which is essentially a strong soap, should be able to wash away most of that oil. Um, if you're worried about it, do an extra rinse on your cycle. That can't, that can't hurt. Um, but usually one cycle is probably enough with the amount of water that goes in, with the amount of soap that goes in there. Um, I think that's generally okay. We find that petroleum jelly is a good protectant as to form a barrier on our skin. Do you find something like that could be helpful as an alternative? Yeah, um, petroleum jelly can be helpful as a barrier, just like any other cream. The whole idea of putting petroleum jelly on is here's your skin, here's petroleum jelly. So if the oil comes in on top of the petroleum jelly, it doesn't directly contact your skin. That being said, my guess is the petroleum jelly probably gets rubbed off after a period of time. So it becomes essentially useless unless you are able to constantly reapply in thick globs, the thicker, the better. I think the creams like Ivy Block, which actually has a chemical that inactivates the oil, as opposed to just merely protecting your skin from the oil, is more likely to be helpful. Better yet, if you're able to wear clothing over it, which doesn't get rubbed off and doesn't depend on being a really thick glob, that's probably even better. But if you have nothing else, certainly petroleum jelly is probably better than using nothing at all. Thank you. And while we see if there are any final questions in the chat, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Um, yeah, you know, if you guys get this really itchy rash that you think could definitely be poison ivy, I would jump on it pretty quickly because if you were to wait, you are giving your time, your body time to develop more of this reaction that can be very uncomfortable. I probably wouldn't jump to oral steroids at the first instance. I think starting off with some sort of a topical medication just to see where it goes can be a good first step. But I think I would have a very short um, window to kind of, or a, kind of a short runway to maybe pull that trigger on doing a systemic medication especially if you have a history of bad poison ivy, or if you know you came in contact with poison ivy and you know it's gonna become something, starting that treatment early on can shorten the duration of which you have poison ivy for sure. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was a very informative session. And for everyone that took the time to join us, thank you so much. As I had mentioned, today's session 
is being recorded. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Once you're on the homepage, if you scroll towards the bottom, there's a section that's titled Past Blum Center Programs. That's where the recordings are posted. You can also click on the News and Events tab and you can locate the recordings there. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of the day. Take care, thank you.